Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number 10. Let's get started. So first, a 60 year old man presents with persistent high grade fever associated with chills, productive cough and night sweats since one month. The patient also notes that the cough is worse when lying to one side. On examination, pallor and clubbing are noted. The following is his chest x-ray. What is the diagnosis? A. C. A. Lung. B. Lung abscess. C. Apical TB. And D. Pancos tumor. So, th pause, think, and then we'll answer. So, very easy, very straightforward question. All the features of a lung abscess are present here. So, the answer is B. Lung abscess. So, firstly, persistent high-grade fever with chills. So, remember, whenever you see high-grade fever anywhere, you should always have an abscess in mind. So high grade fever associated with chills and riga, you should think of some suppurative collection somewhere in the body. Even if it's not a lung case, it could be a gluteal abscess, it could be brain abscess. Any of these abscesses usually present with high grade fever and chills. And productive cough, night sweats, again, can be seen in lung abscess. And the cough is worse when lying to one side. So if you remember your medicine, especially the clinics, when the patient lies to the opposite side, the cough in superative lung diseases get worse. I'll give you the example with this diagram. So here we have the abscess in this case, which is on the right side. So this patient will have cough which worsens when he lies on to the left side. So how do you remember this? Remember, this abscess is a collection of pus and superative material. And when he lies down onto the opposite side, this pus or collection moves into the airways and when it enters the airways, it irritates the airways, causing him to cough. So remember, in superative lung diseases, the individual uh, coughs when he lies on to the opposite side of the lesion. So all these were ticks for lung abscess. Over that, they are also told there is clubbing. So if we know lung abscess is a cause for clubbing. So the answer is B, lung abscess. Now we'll talk a little bit about this X-ray for those who couldn't identify. Firstly, you can see a well circumscribed mass in the right upper zone and you can see that it has a thick well defined wall right a thick well defined wall and most importantly you can see a air fluid level okay this is the air and this is the fluid or the collection so you can see a air fluid level which is typical of an abscess so all the features of an abscess you can see in this x-ray so very easy question very straightforward question before we move on to the next question, a little bit about clubbing. So you should know that clubbing, there are few important causes of clubbing and you should know few respiratory causes, few cardiac causes and few GI causes of clubbing that are important. So firstly, you should know that clubbing is mostly associated with respiratory conditions and the respiratory conditions where clubbing is seen include lung cancer, any lung malignancy, including mesothelioma. Then you also have superative lung diseases, bronchiectasis, empyema and lung abscess and also in cystic fibrosis. So these are few important respiratory causes. Then cardiac causes, remember cyanotic heart disease. So cyanotic congenital heart disease can have clubbing. Other than that, you can also see it in infective endocarditis and also in atrial myxoma. Only three important causes of cardiac cause of clubbing, congenital uh, cyanotic cyanotic heart diseases not a cyanotic congenital cyanotic heart diseases infective endocarditis and atrial myxoma then among the gi causes a few important ones include ibd inflammatory bowel disease both ulcerative colitis and crohn's liver cirrhosis has been associated with clubbing and also some malignancies like gi lymphoma have been associated with clubbing so these are the few other gi conditions where you can see clubbing there are many more these are few important ones i thought i should highlight let's go to the second question so this is a little more concept based question little more difficult so we'll have to think more so first uh, so second question a 10 year old girl presents to the opd with history of fever abdominal discomfort and rash as seen in the image all over the trunk which started three days back on examination, she was found to have mild splenomegaly and routine investigations revealed leukopenia. A week later, she had an acute abdominal event and died. Which of the following is the most likely finding on autopsy? A. Esophageal perforation B. Longitudinal ulcers along the ileum C. Pinpoint ulcers along the ileum and D. Pseudopolyps So what could be found in the autopsy of this patient? Pause, think, process the question well. There's a lot to think here. 
So firstly, we need to diagnose the condition. What could this be? So there is fever, abdominal discomfort and rash. This rash, okay, which is seen only over the trunk and it started around three days back. On examination, we also saw the patient had mild splenomegaly and on investigations, there was leukopenia. And later, a week later, she died of some acute abdominal event. So when we see this history of fever, abdominal discomfort and this rash, it's nothing but a pale rash which is seen over the trunk, which is nothing but your rose spots. We think of salmonella typhi or enteric fever. So this is a beautiful history for enteric fever so or typhoid so rose spots were seen fever vague abnormal pain and mild splenomegaly so all these are features of enteric fever which we'll discuss in good detail so now we know the diagnosis is enteric fever but that is not the question so to answer this question you need to know three things the first thing is what the diagnosis is so we made the diagnosis as enteric fever it's a fairly detailed history pointing towards enteric fever the second thing we need to know is what are the clinical stages of enteric fever so that we know which stage this girl belonged to and the third thing or the clinical phases and the third thing we need to know is what are the pathological changes seen in enteric fever what are the complications of enteric fever and what are the pathological changes seen in enteric fever so now let's talk about the clinical stages of enteric fever so firstly the incubation is 18 or sorry 8 to 18 days you should just remember 14 days if you remember two weeks is good enough so 14 days is the incubation period and there are four important weeks and four or different events happen in a week wise manner so in the first week you'll have all your prodromal symptoms which are your vague headache malaise vague abdominal pain so all those things then the more specific symptoms start which is very particularly fever in this case you'll have a continuous high grade fever which keeps increasing in temperature so every day it will keep going up a little so this kind of fever is called a step ladder fever and you end up with a high grade fever by the end of the week and remember you start with a moderate fever and it keeps going up and it is continuous so the fever never touches the baseline or the temperature never touches the baseline so you have a continuous step ladder fever then you may also have constipation or diarrhea sometimes constipation followed by diarrhea and when there is diarrhea, you'll have a pea soup kind of diarrhea. So that's what I've displayed here. It looks, it's a very greenish type of diarrhea. So pea soup diarrhea. So that was what you saw in the first week of typhoid. In week two, it's more of a examination finding that you notice. So firstly, you can have mild hepatosplenomegaly. Rose spots can be seen, which are nothing but pale salmon kernel patches, which are present all over the trunk. Okay. And you can also have a relative bradycardia. So what is relative bradycardia? Remember, normally when the temperature rises, you, the heartbeat also goes up or the pulse goes up. But in typhoid, the pulse doesn't go up. So it's called relative bradycardia. So the pulse doesn't go proportionate to the rise in temperature. So these, what, these are what happened in week one and week two. Now we'll go to week three, which is very important. And you can call this the week of complications. So this is the most crucial week. This is where the patient can die. And this is where most of your complications of typhoid are seen. So in week three, usually the patient becomes toxic looking. You can see this picture here, very toxic looking. Patient may have some altered consciousness, sometimes delirium. Usually they are just drowsy or sometimes may even be comatose. So altered consciousness and a very weak looking, toxic looking patient. And you can have any of these complications. So first complication is intestinal hemorrhage perforation, osteomyelitis, meningitis, UTI, cholecystitis. So I want you to only remember two very important ones here. One is your intestinal hemorrhage, which is the most common complication, followed by ileal perforation or intestinal perforation, which is the second most common complication. And remember, typhoid is the most common cause of ileal perforation in tropical countries. So typically, typhoid causes ileal perforation and that can lead to death. So remember this very important complication of typhoid patient can die from an infective condition like typhoid because of this so all these complications happen in the third week fourth week is a week of convalescence patient starts improving and getting better so we discussed about the clinical structure of typhoid very briefly remember week one starts with prodromal symptoms malice headache wake abdominal pain then starts developing a fever and the fever gradually increases each day doesn't ever touch the baseline so it's also called step ladder fever 
there can be either constipation or diarrhea in week 2 usually they present to the doctor so you look you have a few examination findings you should know one is relative bradycardia the second thing is some mild hepatosplenic megaly and raw spots may be seen over the trunk that is the chest abdomen and the back okay week 3 very important week of complications you will have a very toxic looking patient very tired worn out patient sometimes altered consciousness maybe drowsy or comatose and this is where you see the most important complications two of which are intestinal hemorrhage and perforation very important week 4 patient starts getting better now let's look at this question where do you think the patient was so remember the patient presented to us during the second week so patient presented with a mild hepatosplenomegaly and all the other initial first week features and there was leukopenia and the patient died the next week so patient died during the third week and what could have been this dreaded complication or this acute abnormal event that killed the patient it is most likely to be a ileal perforation so that could be the answer but look at the options there is no ileal perforation so esophageal perforation doesn't happen we already discussed it usually happens in the ileocecum ileum cecum or ileocecal junction most commonly in the ileum because remember these this perforation happens due to invasion of the salmonella into the payers patches then hypertrophy of payers patches and then perforation and payers patches are in the ileum so we are looking for ileal perforation so that's not there here so option a is ruled out d is also ruled out so it must be option b or c so we not only have to know that the ileum is involved but now we have to know what kind of ulcer is seen in case of a typhoid so here we'll discuss a little bit about the ulcer look at this picture remember this picture so usually in typhoid or enteric fever you get oval shaped or longitudinal ulcers so remember you have longitudinal ulcers and in the autopsy of this patient you would have seen longitudinal ulcers in the ileum so it's option b patient died from ileal perforation and if you do the autopsy other than the perforation you will also find the presence of these longitudinal ulcers so a few features of these ulcers they are again oval shaped or longitudinal they have raised edges you can see the raised edges here and a blackish base and they are most commonly seen at the ileocecal junction okay so that was about the second question answer was b last question for today the earliest manifestation of diabetic nephropathy is a microalbuminuria b increased gfr d decreased gfr or uh, sorry c decreased gfr or d macroalbuminuria pause think and then we'll answer so the answer here very tricky question is actually b increased gfr most of us mark microalbuminuria so remember microalbuminuria is a diagnostic feature it is one of the earliest things we can diagnostically catch but increased gfr is the first or the earliest manifestation so i'll try to explain the pathophysiology of this in a very brief way because we have very little time so this is the sequence i'll tell you about the sequence so remember the earliest and first manifestation is increased gfr so in diabetic nephropathy usually it is not just diabetes causing the issue but it is diabetes along with hypertension okay so usually diabetes cause hyperglycemia which eventually causes hypertension because of atherosclerotic changes and whatnot so diabetes and hypertension come together and this hypertension is what actually causes the changes over time so let's look at the renal corpuscle okay basic anatomy you have an afferent arteriole which brings the blood you have a efferent arteriole which takes away the blood in the glomerular capillary network these are the glomerular capillaries and they are lined by the capillary membrane and the glomerular basement membrane which filter out the GFR which goes through here. You have a few interstitial cells or cells in between these purple cells called the mesangial cells. So what happens in diabetic nephropathy? So I told you there is diabetes and then there is hypertension. So when there is hypertension, there is increased pressure in the glomerular, glomerular capillary system. So the pressure in the glomerular capillary system increases. Okay, And when the pressure in the glomerular capillary system increases, it begins to, over time, it starts to damage the capillary. And slowly, because of the increased pressure, the GFR increases. So the first step here was increased GFR. So pressure increased. Because the pressure increases, more and more starts to more and more fluid starts to get filtered, fil filtered. So the first step is increased GFR. Then with time, 
because of this chronically increased pressure cytokines are produced by the cells in the glomerulus and the me these mesangial cells begin to proliferate so as the mesangial cells proliferate and the cytokines are released the permeability of this glomerular basement membrane increases the gap because the mesangial cells in the middle are proliferating the gaps between each of these cells start increasing and more and more or larger and larger uh, molecules start getting filtered and that is when you have micro global uh, micro albuminuria which is the first and the earliest diagnostic marker for this disease so we can diagnose earliest or best during this period 300 to 300 mg day per day of excretion is called micro albuminuria as the disease progresses these gaps continue to enlarge the mesangium continues to proliferate and larger and larger molecules start going out then you have more molecules going out so you will have macro albuminuria so initially few molecules went out then as the gaps increased more and more so you will have initially micro then macro and finally end stage renal disease so remember in diabetes mellitus there was hypertension hypertension increased the pressure in the glomerular system because of increased pressure in the glomerular system more and more fluid and more and more filtrate started being formed and over time because of increased pressure cellular changes occur the gap increases fenestrations increase and more and more molecules start being passed and that becomes proteinuria and finally a end stage renal disease so if you still didn't understand i know it's not too clear think of a horse think of a horse this is the end of the horse and here you have the tap through which water is coming okay here you have the tap through which water is coming so you are pumping water into this horse at a slow rate as you increase the rate more force of water goes through the exit now think of a opening here which filters it this is nothing but this opening okay here so it filters it so as you increase the pressure in the hose that is what hypertension does more fluid starts going out through here also so therefore hypertension or increased pressure in the glomerular capillary system causes increased filtration which is nothing but increased GFR. So remember, increased GFR is the earliest manifestation, but the earliest detectable or diagnostic marker is the microalbuminuria. And then you know how the disease progresses. So that's it for today. Thank you. Hope it was good. We'll see you tomorrow.